Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today involves a very bizarre disappearance. It's really frustrating and the way that it's being handled is less than ideal. This is a case that I think is really going to rely on information from the public, so make sure you go ahead and check out any of the contacts that I have listed down below after hearing the details of this case. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody's thoughts and theories are on this case. With that being said, let's just jump right into it. Today, we are going to be discussing the disappearance of Sarm Heslop. I also do want to apologize in advance for my voice. If it sounds a little bit more raspy or stuffy or nasally than normal, I'm not sick or anything. I just woke up like this. I think my room is just really dry, so there's that. But either way, Sarm Joan Lillian Heslop was born December 19th, 1979 to parents Peter Heslop and Brenda Street, and I believe she had one older brother named Jason, and she is from Southampton, England. Sarm was described as being generous, loving, and kind with a vibrant personality and a love for adventure. Sarm had been working as a flight attendant for the airline Flybe, which is no longer an operating airline. By the time Sarm hit her 30s, she grew a deep love for being out in the open waters and sailing. So by 2019, Sarm and two friends decided to take some time off of work and go and live on a boat and sail across the Atlantic. She went island hopping for some time before ending up at the U.S. Virgin Islands in late 2019. While there, she fell in love with island life and she decided to move there for the time being. She started working towards her dream of becoming a chef while living there. She absolutely loved the island life and she was a huge foodie. She was constantly posting different pictures of her beach life, boating, and food presentations. But during that time, even though she was island hopping and traveling the world, Sarm always made sure to keep contact with her family. She would call her mother at least once a week or any time that she could as long as she had service. By July of 2022, Sarm met a 44-year-old man named Ryan Bain on Tinder and the two started dating. Ryan Bain grew up in Michigan and eventually went on to study at Central Michigan University where he earned his MBA. He started working as an automotive parts salesman and worked for various Fortune 500 companies. He loved sailing on Lake Michigan from the age of 10, but he always just had this drive to do something different. He started to become tired of the cold Michigan winters, so he decided to move to the Caribbean back in 2015 to work as a charter boat captain at St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Ryan, who referred to himself as Captain Ryan, also had a deep love for being outdoors and going on adventures. He loved sailing, deep sea fishing, surfing, dancing, and just having a good time. I believe he was either working towards or had his deep sea diving master certificate, and he also started his own charter boat company. He also worked as a seaplane pilot as well. Friends described that the two of them quickly fell in love, but while they had dated, Sarm never gave up her love for travel and adventure. While they were dating, Sarm, who was living off of her savings at the time, she flew in to see some friends in Malta where she stayed for a bit, making money by being a waitress. But during that time, her family reports that Sarm told them that she started missing her boyfriend, Ryan. So she moved back to the Virgin Islands by February of 2021. The last text that she sent to her mom was actually on Valentine's Day to let her know that she made it back to St. Thomas and that Ryan had picked her up from the airport. After that, Sar moved on to Ryan's 47-foot catamaran. There, she worked as a chef for tourists who would visit Ryan's boat. Friends say that Sarm worked on Ryan's boat, obviously as a way to make money and because her passion was cooking, but also to be closer to Ryan. Friends said that the two seemed to be very happy with their lives together at this time. Sarm's Instagram is full of pictures of her soaking up the beach, boating, and photos of Ryan's Labrador Hunter at the beach. 
she seemed to be having such a perfect life in paradise. She would also text her mom all of the time pictures of them going on the yachts, going canoeing, going diving, and meeting other yacht owners and making new friends. By March 7th, 2021, according to Ryan, him and Sarm went to a dinner at a local pub on the island of St. John called 420 to Center. After that, the couple took their inflatable dinghy back to Ryan's boat, the Siren Song, which was anchored about 100 feet from shore on Frank Bay. According to Ryan, they then watched some Netflix and chilled in bed for a little bit before going to bed just after 10 p.m. However, by 2 a.m., now going into March 8th, Ryan reported that he was awoken by the boat's anchor alarm, which goes off if the boat starts drifting from the anchor. He said that upon being woken up, that is when he noticed that Sarm was missing. So, by 2.30 a.m., Ryan called the authorities to report Sarm as a missing person. On this call, though, the local authorities told Ryan to call the U.S. Coast Guard to report her as missing. However, Ryan did not make this call until much later, almost nine hours later, at 11.46 a.m. on March 8th. On that call, Ryan told the authorities that he couldn't find Sarm and that she must have fallen off of the boat. According to locals at the time, there was a bit of a rough current by the shore, but where the boat was anchored in Frank Bay, that area was very calm waters. When police got to the boat after the report was made, they saw that the dinghy was still attached to the boat, meaning that obviously Sarm did not take the dinghy and go away from the boat and to shore. So, the initial thought was that maybe Sarm fell or jumped off of the side of the boat and then swam to shore, but like I said, the current was pretty strong by the shore, so doing that would have been pretty dangerous. Because of this, friends of Sarm really began to worry about her well-being. Either way, once Ryan called the Coast Guard, they showed up shortly after to begin their search and rescue operations. Now, I know I'm jumping back and forth a little bit, but I do just want to point out that when the Coast Guard showed up was the same time that the local authorities showed up with them, so just after the 11.46 a.m. call, so around noon when they showed up, that is when they saw that, you know, the dinghy was still on the boat. Now, when all of them showed up, of course, one of the first things that they wanted to do was to search Ryan's boat for any clues, but he would not let them. He actually did not want them to board his boat at all. Despite his protests, though, officers decided to go onto the upper deck of the boat anyways. According to Ricardo Castrodad of the U.S. Coast Guard, when the officers were on the upper deck, Ryan stood at the doorway that goes to the inside of the boat and told officers that they were not allowed inside. At that time, they actually issued Ryan a citation for obstructing officers from searching the boat in order to investigate her disappearance. But that didn't really accomplish anything because, as far as I know, the police were never granted access to search the interior of the boat to this day. They were never able to get a warrant of the boat, I guess, because it wasn't considered a criminal investigation at the time, only a missing persons investigation, and I guess if they don't have enough probable cause or evidence to get the warrant to search inside of the boat, if Ryan, you know, disagrees or pushes back, they don't have to be granted the warrant. That's something that I will get more into in just a few minutes. According to reports, when investigators first showed up to the boat, Ryan was heavily intoxicated and he refused to give investigators the paperwork for the boat. He gave them expired credentials and again, he blocked investigators from going inside. I'm not super well versed in how a boat is searched or the requirements that you have to have to own a boat and to live on it, but from my understanding, the authorities did do basic safety checks on the areas of the boat that they were able to access. It seems like a relatively routine thing for boats. I know that they have to have the proper paperwork, just like you do with your car registration. I know that it has to meet certain safety guidelines for you to be able to live on that boat and all of that. So, all of the documentation that Ryan was giving the police, there were issues with that. So, in addition to the citation for blocking entry, he was also issued several other violations, including failure to provide a certificate for documentation of the vessel, 
vessel and safety equipment violations. Either way, during the initial search, police did question Ryan, who said that he was absolutely heartbroken and devastated at Sarm's disappearance. He also did hand over most of Sarm's personal belongings, including her cell phone, her iPad, and her passport, which were all left behind. Authorities also said that while they cannot confirm that she did actually board the boat that night, investigators have said that her other personal belongings, including her shoes and her purse, which still had her money and credit cards in it, were on board when they arrived. So that shows that those belongings somehow ended up on the boat at some point, whether that means that Sarm was with them they're not exactly sure. Additionally, the authorities and the Coast Guard all searched the bay near where the boat was anchored, both by helicopter and boat. They also launched a search of adjacent islands and the waters all around from the sea, from where the islands were that they were searching, all the way to where the boat was anchored. After the initial response, I do believe that the FBI also joined in on the searches to help the Virgin Islands Police Department with their investigation, though I'm not 100% sure how much they were able to help. I'm not sure if they just helped with the searches and no other aspects of the investigation. There is a little bit of confusion around the FBI's involvement in this case, which again, I will get more into later in this video. The authorities also said that they went around the entire 20 square mile radius around the island to search for her as well, but they found nothing. They also had divers go in and do an analysis of sea currents around the time that she went missing to see where SARM would have ended up if she had gone in the water. And again, they used helicopters and drones to search as well. They said that the water conditions were actually pretty perfect during the searches, but still they found nothing. Then there was a group of witnesses who came forward to talk about what they saw the day before SARM went missing. Their boat was anchored around 100 feet away from Ryan's boat in Frank Bay. One witness from the boat said that he saw Ryan pull his boat into the area and then anchor it by himself with ease. He said that he clearly had the skill to do all of this maneuvering by himself to get himself in the spot that he was in. The witness said that on March 7th, he saw both Sarm and Ryan on the boat that Sunday morning and early evening. He said that they were just relaxing all day and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Then he said that after having dinner, the witness and this group of friends all went to bed at around 10 p.m. They said that they didn't hear any sort of unusual sounds or any commotion that night. The next morning, the group woke up early to do an early morning fishing tour. When they woke up, they found that the siren song was anchored in the same spot that it was the day before and, you know, right when they went to bed. The dinghy was still on the boat, but he did not see either Sarm or Ryan that morning. When the group returned from their fishing trip on the evening of March 8th, that is when they learned of Sarm's disappearance. And when they learned about her disappearance, they said that they were really surprised at Ryan's lack of concern when, you know, he told them about it. They said that he never raised the alarm for anybody in the area. One of the witnesses said, quote, If I woke up at 2 a.m. and my girlfriend was missing, I'd start yelling and wake up every other boat in the area and would have gotten onto the dinghy, bang on the boat, you know, help me, help me, but nothing. Then another witness who I guess was walking their dog on shore on the land came forward to say that they actually heard what to them sounded like a scream at around 1 a.m. on March 8th. However, I haven't been able to find much more about this witness or this situation. I've only seen it reported in a few sources and I don't know how much it's been followed up on. So I do just want to put that out there that I'm not exactly sure what to make of this, but I do just want to put this one out there. Very shortly after Sarm's disappearance, Ryan lawyered up, which again is not something that I want to point out as being overtly suspicious. We say that in literally any case that we cover that, you know, getting a lawyer right away after a loved one goes missing, that's actually something that you absolutely should do. But at the same time, that coupled with Ryan's lack of cooperation is very concerning to Sarm's family. According to Sarm's mother, Ryan texted her on the morning of March 8th to let her know that Sarm was missing. So she then called him via WhatsApp video chat. 
When they spoke, he seemed very calm. He never seemed overtly panicked or concerned or even all that nervous. After that initial contact, she said that Ryan blocked her from contacting him again, so she hasn't been able to talk to him since about a week after the disappearance. Brenda would also be in contact with the Virgin Islands Police Department throughout the course of the following months. According to Brenda, when she initially disappeared, as we know, it was kind of in the midst of the lockdowns of the pandemic, so they weren't able to actually go there to search in person. So, all she was able to do was talk to the authorities via video chat. She was told by the authorities that they did go to the courts and asked for a warrant to search Ryan's boat, but they were denied. They said that they actually did this multiple times and they kept being denied. She said that they weren't ever granted the warrant and again, part of this was because of Ryan's lack of cooperation, which to me doesn't make any sense. The fact that he's not cooperating and doesn't want them to search the boat should actually be like even more reason for them to search it, but that's just me. Brenda is just confused as to why Ryan... Brenda is just confused as to why Ryan is not cooperating to the best of his ability. To outsiders, if you have a loved one who went missing under suspicious circumstances and you know that people are looking at you, most people would be very open to investigators searching your property or your car or your boat or whatever it is, even if it's just to save face and show the public that you have nothing to hide but that isn't what Ryan is doing at all. As police continued in their investigation, they were able to confirm where the couple had dinner that night. Now, right after Sarm went missing, according to her parents, they were told that there was no CCTV footage from the bar that they were last known to be at due to a power outage that erased the footage. However, about a year after the disappearance, when her parents were finally able to visit in person, they were shown footage of the couple as they left the 420 to Center bar that night. The footage showed them leaving the bar and then walking on the deck that led to the dinghy, and then it showed as they were walking and about to get on the dinghy, but then it gets dark and you can't see if they actually ever boarded the dinghy. So you can see that they were like, about to, but then it goes dark. And the family, the parents, aren't exactly sure why. They don't know if police stopped the footage before this, if it was edited, or if that's just how it was somehow. But either way, that is what it showed. And we're not exactly sure if they ever got on the dinghy that night. Another thing with the CCTV footage is in the missing persons report, Ryan apparently told the authorities that Sarm was last seen wearing a black dress with flowers on it. But in the CCTV footage, Sarm was actually wearing a skirt or shorts with a tank top, so that is a strange inconsistency. Her parents also said that when they were given some of her personal belongings after the disappearance, there was no sign of a black dress with flowers on it anywhere in her personal belongings. Now, they weren't given all of her personal belongings, which I'll explain more in just a minute, but with her clothes that they were given, they did not see this black dress. They don't really know what to make of this, but to me, this says that she either changed when she got back into that black dress, so she was wearing the tank top and shorts or a skirt when she went to the bar, got back, changed into the dress, and then she was wearing it when she disappeared, or he misremembered what she was wearing, or he lied about what she was wearing for whatever reason. Either way, Sarm's parents have asked the authorities to release the CCTV footage of her last known whereabouts, but for whatever reason, they will not do this. Another very frustrating aspect of this case is that the call that Ryan made to the Coast Guard to report Sarm as a missing person was never actually recorded because of a system error. So, the family is very frustrated that neither they nor anybody else can listen to the audio from that call. As we know from a lot of 911 calls that we've listened to throughout all of these different cases, a lot of emergency calls can tell us a lot about how someone is speaking and reacting to a situation. It can be very telling as to what is really going on when they're talking to the dispatcher, 
but we aren't able to get a hold of that information because of this system error. So no one's been able to listen to this call or examine it. Then in addition to all of this, we also find out that Ryan actually had an ex-wife. So Ryan had gotten married to a woman named Corey back in 2008, and during their relationship, Corey has accused Ryan of multiple instances of abuse. She reports that Ryan almost had this split personality about him. Outwardly, he was always this fun-loving, carefree personality, but then there were other instances when he would fly into a rage and he would physically abuse his wife, Corey. Back in 2011, Ryan actually spent three weeks in jail after he pled guilty to domestic abuse. In the early morning hours of November 27th, 2011, Corey told the authorities that Ryan and her had been driving home from a wedding when they had gotten into a verbal argument. Ryan was driving at the time, and I guess he became really upset because Corey had been asking him for directions to get home. The two continued arguing until they did get home, and then once they were home, Ryan allegedly grabbed her and dragged her out of the car and into the house. Once inside, she said that Ryan grabbed her in the dining room and then threw her to the ground and smashed her head onto the floor repeatedly, chipping one of her teeth. Responding officers found that Corey did have a chipped tooth that appeared to be fresh. She had blood on her right earlobe and she had scratches on her ear as well. Then her right shoulder and the right side of her neck both showed scratches as well, and then her right eyelid was red and there were scratches on her eyelid as well. However, when Ryan was interviewed by the police, he said that Corey was actually the one who attacked him and tried dragging him out of the car when they got home, not the other way around. But according to police documents, there were no physical signs of Ryan being attacked anywhere on his body. The evidence clearly pointed towards Corey being the one who was attacked. After this incident and throughout the remainder of their marriage, Corey said that there were times that he would have like a really good week, but then all of a sudden out of nowhere, he would suddenly change. She said that not a day went by during their marriage that she didn't fear him. And as they were getting divorced in 2014, as the proceedings were still going through, she said that she was so scared of him that she slept with a shotgun under her pillow. So clearly that information puts new perspective on the man that Sarm was with. We now know that he had a very clear history of violent behaviors and domestic violence to the point of causing harm to his partner. Now, for the initial weeks after Sarm's disappearance, Ryan stayed put and stayed anchored in Frank Bay. However, near the end of March, Ryan left the area. According to police, he wasn't considered a suspect at this time, so they had no way of stopping him from leaving. Now, he is currently traveling around the Caribbean, and police have admitted that they don't actually know exactly where he is at this time. So, basically, police lost him. Police have come out with a plea to get Ryan to contact them, saying that he is a person of interest. I guess they were trying to have an emotional plea to him, getting him to, like, show where he is. They said that they do believe that he is still within the U.S. Virgin Islands territory, but obviously, they cannot be sure. It's said that he's not hiding, he's just traveling, and there's no reason that he shouldn't be able to go wherever he wants, so... That's sort of like what this was being presented as, I guess, by his lawyer. But either way, there was one witness who spotted Ryan in Granada. I apologize if I'm saying that wrong, but that's about 500 miles south of the U.S. Virgin Islands. And this witness said that he seems to be doing just fine. He's living a playboy lifestyle and he doesn't seem to have a care in the world. Those who have spotted him said that he occasionally will have a friendly conversation with passerbys and has females over on his boat occasionally. Others have said that they've seen him meticulously cleaning his boat on many occasions. Then by November of 2021, he actually put up his boat for sale for $229,000 and then he changed the name of the boat from the Siren Song to Orion's Belt 
I'm not sure yet if he had sold the boat or not, but if you do know, please let me know down below. I haven't been able to find that more recent information. It hasn't really been reported on it, but if you do happen to know, let us know down below if he was able to sell his boat. With this case as a whole, Sarm's family is so very frustrated with how this has been able to play out understandably. They're first upset that when Ryan initially called 911, that instead of reporting to the incident to the Coast Guard themselves, they left it up to Ryan to do so, and as we know, he didn't report it until several hours later. The authorities should have notified the Coast Guard themselves as soon as they got the report because then maybe they could have gone out to search immediately and maybe they could have found her at that point. The family is also frustrated at the fact that they asked the police to be given her personal items back like her phone and her iPad, but the police are still holding them and won't give them up to the family. We don't know if the authorities have looked into these devices, if they've been able to get the digital forensics or looked through calls or texts or anything like that. I have no idea if that's something that they ended up doing, but I feel like that would be a huge part to this case and they should have done it if they didn't. Again, it is an open and ongoing investigation, so they haven't shared everything with the public, so I really hope they looked into her cell phone records, but they haven't said whether or not they have, so we're just not sure. The family also wants the police to release the CCTV footage from when Sarm was last seen. They can't understand what harm would come from releasing that footage because maybe it could help someone in the public remember if they saw her or heard anything from that night. Then the family is just so, so very frustrated with the fact that Ryan's boat had never been searched. The fact that they've tried to get the warrants to search the boat, but they continue to get denied because, again, I guess Ryan kept rejecting the request and they didn't have enough probable cause to get the warrant and now he's trying to sell the boat, which is going to cause even more issues for getting that warrant to search. Because if he's not the owner of the boat anymore, then they're going to have to get their permission, and if they can't get their permission, then they don't really have reasonable cause to search the boat if they don't already have it with Ryan owning the boat, which I don't understand how they can't get their probable cause she was literally last seen on that boat according to the last person who saw her alive, so I have no idea why they're not able to get that warrant. If you know more about that, again, please let me know because as far as I've seen with the information that I was able to find in my research, the reason they're not able to get it is because they don't have enough probable cause because this is a missing persons investigation and not a criminal investigation, even though she very may well have gone missing by foul play. So, I really don't understand why they're not able to get the warrant to search the place that she was last seen. Then, Brenda has come out to say that even though she has tried to stay in contact with the Virgin Islands police, they simply are not responding. She said that all of the questions about the investigation have gone unanswered and they just aren't giving her anything. Now, one inconsistency that I've seen with some articles is that it states that the FBI got involved with the investigation, while others report that the family has been begging the Virgin Islands police to let the FBI and the British police help but they have all denied the help, which is just very frustrating and does not make any sense. I do know pretty confidently that the British police have not been allowed to help. The reason they want the British police to get involved is because SARM is from Great Britain, so it makes sense that they want those police to be able to help, but they aren't allowing them to help. Brenda and I believe her husband have gone out to the Virgin Islands just to see where her daughter was last seen and feel the presence of her daughter. They've said that being in the water where she was last seen, they can just feel her presence. They do think that at this point, she has most likely died, but the fact that the investigation has gotten absolutely nowhere is just insanely frustrating. So, now I want to get into the theories of this case. So, the first theory is that maybe Sarm had jumped off of the boat that night and then swam to the shore and then something happened to her once she reached the shore and got out of the water. Her friends and family say that she is a very, very strong swimmer, so it could be possible that she either left because she felt threatened by Ryan that night, or she jumped off the boat for some other reason. 
but either way, it's possible that she could have swam to shore that night. Now, even though the U.S. Virgin Islands are considered safe, they do still have some of the highest crime rates in the Caribbean. Last year, there were 49 homicides among the different islands in the area, even though there's a population of only 106,000. Some people believe that if she made it to shore, that she maybe tried to get a ride with someone or trusted the wrong person and that person harmed her. Or, of course, there's always the thought that she got to shore and then left her own life on her own free will, but... With that, I will say that her family has said that there's absolutely no reason to believe that she would have just left her life and gone this long without contacting them. They just do not think that that's something that Sarm would have done. And the fact that Ryan is not cooperating, again, just makes that feel less likely. I did just want to say that out there. Maybe she's out there somewhere living her life, but her family just does not think that that's possible and neither does her friends. Every single person who knows her say that that is just not something she would ever do. So the other thought with this, with the idea of her going off of the boat when she was still alive, is that she either fell or jumped off of the side of the boat and then attempted to swim to the shore, but she wasn't able to and she drowned in the water. As we know, the area where the boat was anchored was known to be very calm, but the shore itself was said to have been pretty rough. So, if she fell off either by being pushed or accidentally falling off, or if she jumped off either again because she was in fear for whatever reason or for some other reason, it is possible that she tried swimming to shore, but she didn't make it due to the rough conditions. Now, one thing I want to mention is that Ryan was found to have been intoxicated hours after he initially reported Sarm as missing. So, does that mean that he was drinking all night and that he was so intoxicated that he was still drunk nine hours later, or had he been drinking until that point? Either way, it could be possible that Sarm also drank quite a bit that evening. Again, we don't know for sure, but the fact that they were at a bar can say that she may have been drinking, and by the time she got to the boat, maybe she was also pretty intoxicated. Maybe as both of them were intoxicated, a fight broke out and she either was pushed off of the edge or she jumped off thinking that she could swim to shore and get away. But because of how intoxicated she was, she wasn't as strong of a swimmer as she normally was. And if that were the case, then it makes sense how she could have you know, gone out, tried swimming, and instead she drowned and got swept out into the sea. I do think that this is possible that, you know, if Ryan is not directly responsible, that if something he did caused her to fear for her life after getting into an argument or something like that, and then she jumped off, tried swimming, wasn't able to because she was so intoxicated, and that is how she died, and Ryan still doesn't want to tell anyone, obviously, because he pretty much is responsible. However, with this theory, it does make me wonder why she has still never been found. According to reports, they did do pretty extensive searches of this water and it was said to be very clear and searchable water. They sent in divers, used drones, boats, and helicopters and found absolutely no sign of her that day. It's not like they were searching, you know, days and days or weeks after she fell in that water if she was in that water. It was only a couple hours later. So, if she fell in that water, you would think that at some point, something would have been found. It's not guaranteed, again, because water is very, very difficult to search and they absolutely could have missed her. But to me, it's not like she went missing in some swampy area where there's huge rocks everywhere and there's mud everywhere and you just cannot see in the water. This is very beautiful, clear water that is pretty sandy. So, to me, I would think that if they did just as thorough of searches as they say that they did, I think that at some point, they may have found her. Again, it was nine hours, so that could have been long enough for her to get swept out somewhere else. But again, if she was pushed off in the area that they were parked, they said that it was pretty calm there. So, how, you know, would it be possible that somewhere that's pretty calm would sweep someone out to the 
open sea where they just wouldn't be able to find her in that short of a period of time. The other theory with this is that Ryan harmed her on the boat or somewhere on the dinghy or whatever, basically saying that she was harmed before entering the water and then her body was in the boat at some point and then maybe she was dumped in the water there or in my opinion, more likely, maybe he drove the boat out somewhere super far away, dumped her body there farther in the ocean, and then came back. So let's say for the sake of argument that an altercation happened that resulted in her death and her body was on that boat. He called 911, maybe out of panic or maybe because he didn't want anybody to suspect him. And when they told him to contact the National Guard, he sort of used that as a time to figure out a plan. Maybe he wasn't expecting that the National Guard would get involved in this, or maybe he was. I don't really know, but it's possible that during those nine hours that he waited to call the National Guard, that he used that time to go out farther into the ocean and then dump her body far, far away from somewhere that nobody would think to look, because again, he lived there for, what, like seven years or six years at that point, and he'd be pretty well-versed with everything that's around the area. He'd probably know where to go. He probably was very familiar with what areas of the water had heavier currents. He probably knew where people would be and where they wouldn't be at that time of the night, so... I think that if he did go out there, he would know pretty much exactly where to go. And again, because nobody was awake at the time that this happened, nobody noticed that he left and then went back to the same spot. Now, I would like to know more about how busy that area to see if it would even be possible to get back to the same exact spot without being noticed, if there were other boats around, if he would have to like maneuver around other boats to get there, or if it was pretty open my dad has a boat and there are times that like the area is pretty packed so if you leave like you're kind of maneuvering out and you it's kind of difficult to maneuver back in without being noticed so you go to a different spot and just anchor there or if it was pretty open which again I've also experienced it's possible that just went right back to the same spot without anybody noticing how busy it was I think could tell us a lot about how possible it is that he went out that night and came back without anybody noticing. Or if we go even further, it's possible that her body was still on the boat when authorities arrived and that is why he was so adamant about police not going inside of that boat. I think it's possible that if he called the authorities to report her missing, he wasn't expecting authorities to want to enter inside of the boat because as we know, on the call with the National Guard, he said that she must have fallen off. So maybe he was expecting that, you know, there's no way that they would think that she's in the boat because I said, you know, that she fell off. So they're obviously going to look in the water and that's the only place that they're going to look. He could have just not realized that police would have wanted to search the inside of his boat and so her body was still there when they showed up and that's why he didn't want them to come in. It's also possible that if her body wasn't on the boat when they came, that there was just signs of an altercation, blood, something like that around, and he obviously didn't want the police to see that. We don't really know. But what I do know is that, you know, witnesses said that he was at the same spot in Frank Bay for the weeks after the disappearance, but I don't know if that means he was there 24-7 or, again, if it was just the spot that he returned back to each day. Because when I picture having a boat and a spot like that, I picture that you go out during the day, you know, do some things, you're sailing around most days, you know, you park and go out to eat and things like that, and then you come back to the same spot, almost like, you know, a car or an RV that you live in, and you park it in the same spot. If someone says that they are in the same spot for weeks, I don't necessarily think that they're in that exact spot in their car or RV all day, every day normally that would typically mean that they can leave and then they come back to the same spot but that like they didn't go somewhere and they weren't gone for several days before they came back so I think knowing whether he was there like planted there on the boat 24 7 for those weeks or if he left and came back you know like normal that could tell us a lot about if her body could have been dumped after she was reported missing. Because even though he did leave at the end of March, I don't think 
that, you know, he would still have her body on the boat for that many weeks before dumping her. That just does not make sense. Even if it's just for the sake of, like, the smell of having a body, I don't think she would have just been there for that many weeks. So, I don't think that the reason he left Frank Bay was because he had to dump her body somewhere. I think it was most likely because people were suspecting him or because he just didn't want to get caught. I don't really know. Again, that's just my theory. All alleged. We don't know. But I obviously don't think that he had her body on the boat that entire time and that he only dumped it when he left. So to me, those are the main possibilities of what could have happened in this case, in my opinion. I think the fact that Ryan is just not cooperating with the police is very telling. His lawyer has said that he is fully cooperating and doing whatever, you know, they need him to do. But clearly we've seen that that's just not true. I would think that if your significant other fell off your boat and she was never found again, that you would do everything in your power to help out with the searches and do everything humanly possible to find that person. But instead, Ryan refuses to let the police investigate. He has stopped contacting them. He won't return any of their attempts to contact him and he left the area and has not returned back. I think all of that behavior is far too contradicting for someone who lost their significant other and doesn't know where they are or what happened to them. Right now, the family is just hoping that police will investigate properly. They want the FBI and the British police to get involved. They want their questions answered. They just want the police to do their due diligence in investigating this case so that they can hopefully bring their daughter home or at least, at the very least, know what happened to her. The family has created a website called findsarm.com where they post any article that discusses the case and any updates as they come out. If you want to follow the case, make sure you go ahead and check out their website. They also have a Facebook group where they keep up with everything in the case as well, so make sure you go ahead and check that out. Sarm Haslop was 41 years old when she disappeared from a catamaran from South John in the U.S. Virgin Islands in the early morning hours of March 8, 2021. She is described as a Caucasian female, approximately 5 feet 8 inches tall, with an athletic build and long, dark brown hair. She has a large, colorful tattoo on her shoulder depicting a seahorse, butterfly, and a flower. It's been two years since her disappearance, so the family is really hoping for more help from the public. Anyone with information regarding the whereabouts of SARM is urged to contact 911, the Criminal Investigation Bureau at 340-774-2211, or Crime Stoppers USVI at 800-222-TIPS. As always, that information will be listed down below. I urge you, if you do happen to know absolutely anything about this case, please contact who you can. But either way, that is all of the information that I have for today's case, and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think this was some sort of accident where she fell and got swept out to sea? Do you think that fall play is involved? And if so, what do you think happened? Let's discuss that and any other thoughts and theories you have in the comments below. With that, if you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Make sure you go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!